Hello world, it's me, Marky P. I'm in a lot of pain today about Yoko Ono. Everyone keeps attacking her. I don't know why. Leave Yoko alone. Just leave Yoko alone. Just because for two years she sat in on the Beatles recording sessions. She didn't split up the Beatles, just leave. Well, she might have split them up, but leave her alone. It wasn't really the height of rudeness of her when Paul, George and Ringo started jamming on the Let It Be sessions for her to grab a microphone and start screaming, John, John, over and over again. And he kept replying, Yoko, Yoko. I mean, if I was a Beatle, I might have felt like shoving her mic up her arsehole, but leave Yoko alone. Do you think she's been through enough? What with all the inheriting of John Lennon's millions and bleeding him like a cash cow since 1980. <laughs> but even I, I was looking for her 2013 album and I couldn't find it. And then I forgot the title of it. It took me ages to find it, but I did find it. But <laughs> leave Yoko alone. Oh, shut that crap up. <laughs> right, I've got a script here. Because I thought I'd do this without kind of, I suppose, taking too long about it and saying too many uh, ums and stuff like that. So I think you get to the point that I'm making here. There are too many people in the world who blame Yoko Ono for a lot of the world's ills. Perhaps it's all a bit unfair. Let's deal with the Beatles breakup first. On his 1982 album, The First After John's Murder, Paul McCartney sang Here Today as a somewhat schmaltzy tribute to John. But the real highlight the magical musical moment, as it were, of that tug of war LP, such as it was, is a song called The Pound Is Sinking. What starts out sounding like an ode to the stock market suddenly changes course. And Paul sings, hear me, my lover. I can't be held responsible now for something that didn't happen. I knew you for a minute. Oh, it didn't happen only for a minute. Your heart just wasn't in it anymore. And by the time we've reached the end of that stanza, Paul lets out the most awesome blood curdling yell it sets the spine tingling now given that paul's in a nostalgic mood on this album with songs like take it away here today ballroom dancing and get it etc it's quite conceivable that he was singing this part of the song about his pre-linda relationship stroke breakup with jane asher it's very famous uh, at the time for going out with her uh, she was a an actress but given Paul's chatter in the Let It Be film, it might have been John's lack of commitment to the Beatles that the pound of sinking that the pound is sinking was hinting at. That lack of commitment can be traced back to the album Help. John described 1965 as a pretty trying time in his life, and Help the song is well documented as a genuine statement of Help Me. As well as this, Paul's song Yesterday, also on Help. Uh, the most covered Beatles song ever only featured Paul on guitar and a string section. No other Beatles. He thinks he's Beethoven, said George Harrison at the time. Two years later, after the end of the tours, George's only contribution to Sgt Pepper was a solo effort. That's his only songwriting contribution, I should have said that. Again, George is on record as saying that by 1967 he was fed up with having to work his way through umpteen John and Paul songs before he could get them to listen to one of his own. Harrison is on record as saying that the end of touring in 1966 was a good thing because it facilitated the breakup of the Beatles sooner than if they'd had to fulfill a load of contractual live obligations. So they were falling to pieces well before Yoko became a regular fi fixture. Now, Depending on which Beatles hangers-on's dirty washing you want to read about, you might also believe that George was having an affair with Ringo's then wife, Maureen. Well, it's actually true. Um, Eric Clapton fancied George's wife, Patty, and they later got married, and none of that could have helped the band stay together. Add to that the terrible financial mess, 
that uh, Apple and the Beatles were in by 1968, and it was a recipe for disaster. So although Yoko was obviously part of the terrible mess, she was only part of it. So those who blame Paul for suing the others, or Yoko for being omnipresent and not taking the whole picture into account, okay? It was just a terrible mess. They're all part of it. They've all got to accept their own sort of responsibility of it. Even Ringo walked out at one point, so, you know, it wasn't her, specifically. So what about Yoko's music? This is undoubtedly an acquired taste. She has a reputation for screaming and caterwauling for several years at a time. Whilst undoubtedly true, again, this is only part of the picture. Yoko is a classically trained pianist. It's said that she was playing Beethoven's music, uh, it's said that she was playing Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata one day. John asked what it was, changed the time signature, inverted the arpeggio pattern, and because from Abbey Road was born. So this isn't a woman who is devoid of all artistic sensibility. Rather, she reflected the political unrest of the late 60s and early 70s in her music. Now, she had released some solo albums. Most people, tended to stay away from them. I don't doubt. I'm sure that there were many, many people who bought the albums, but uh, yeah, most people tended to stay away from them. So really, the first time that Beatles fans, or Lennon fans in particular, were subjected to Yoko was on the 1972 album, Sometime in New York City. It was the first real mainstream album uh, where her studio recordings were aired, yeah? Heavily influenced by beatnik politicos, at least lyrically, this album features joint and separate compositions from the pair of them. Album one was recorded in the studio, whilst album two was a live jam featuring Lennon and Ono. The album wasn't an unmitigated triumph, it has to be said, but to be fair, Yoko's contributions on the LP are no worse than John's. In places, her singing is quite beautiful, and by and large, the poor reputation it has is undeserved. I actually quite like it, to be honest. That's before you put album two on. There, you will hear Yoko at her most provocative. Oh, okay, a screaming and a caterwauling through all of it, even John's songs. One of them, Don't Cry Kyoko, lasts for nearly 17 very gruelling minutes. Go for a quick shower during it. I did. Part of the issue is that the band of session musicians, including one who appeared to model his fashion sense on Jesus Christ, appeared not to have the blindest clue what they were supposed to be playing most of the time. Hence the whole lot sounded like a total cacophony, and it did. You know, it wasn't just her screaming away, it was the whole band and everything else, it was just a total mess. So if you want to give Yoko a chance, and I strongly recommend that you do, here are the albums I think you should become familiar with in order of presence. Firstly, what could be regarded as the closest to a greatest hits uh, collection Yoko could put out. The album Yes I'm a Witch from 2007 is a collection whereby she asks a lot of underground musicians to choose their favorite Ono song and treat it the way that they treat their own songs. Yes, there are catawalls very occasionally but Yoko's millennial trendy friends veered away from her more controversial output and by and large chose her most palatable proper, in quotes, songs. The result is absolutely sublime. I imagine that it would be more at home played in the underground bars of New York City, but she sounds far more at home in this context than with Elephant's Memory or the Plastic Ono Band in the early 70s. I highly suggest that any would-be Yoko fan starts here. It's absolutely superb. Find it on Apple Music and Spotify and all other music services, I don't doubt. Next, the 2013 album I momentarily forgot the name of and lost. I did find it, it didn't take me long actually. Take Me to the Land of Hell is what it's called. You won't find this on Apple Music and thus I suspect Spotify but you should find the CD on eBay or Amazon. Unlike Yes, I'm a Witch, this is a purely Yoko effort with her and John's son, Sean, in the band. It's a more eclectic section of songs 
ranging from clubland to rock to 20s Noel Coward style. Really? Again, there's a tiny wee bit of screaming. It's the style she's renowned for, but there's loads of groove and melody. It's fabulous. Get to know those two albums first. Okay, so that is Yes, I'm a Witch and Take Me to the Land of Hell. Absolutely gorgeous. And on Take Me to the Land of Hell, there are a few tributes to who I suspect is John or who I suspect or, or what she's saying is that the trauma and the bereftness that she's left with and, and she's singing about that really. Um, it's absolutely wonderful. It really is. The pressing is a tiny bit loudness ward. You might have to turn it down a bit, but it, by and large, it's really good. Really, really good. Now, consider revisiting sometime in New York City. Again, you'll find this on Apple Music. Just play album one. You'll hear Sisters, Oh Sisters, which you will now know because it's on, uh, uh, yes, I'm a witch. Plus John's most famous songs from this period. Incidentally, the version of Woman is the Nigger of the World on this album is the full length version. The version on Shaved Fish and other comp beg your pardon, the version on Shaved Fish and other compilations amidst the We Make Her Bear and Raise Our Children verse. The Luck of the Irish has a beautiful verse from Yoko. So just album one of Sometime in New York City. You'll find it's it's lovely, it's really good. Yes, lyrically he was a bit naive, a bit misguided, got him into trouble, uh, or got, got them both into trouble really, because of John's immigration status and stuff, and you know, people cited the influences on that album for uh, not wanting to let him stay in America. Finally, the album Double Fantasy from 1980. John's take on this album was, hi, how are you? Weren't the 70s a drag? How's your relationship? And again, from Yoko's Yes, I'm a Witch, you'll know Kiss, 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 and every man has a woman who, love him, who loves him. In other places, you'll find a more cynical stance than John's. Give me something and I'm moving on, point to signs that all was not well in the Yoko stroke John relationship. Only I'm losing you gives us a clue that, that from John's point of view, he felt guilt about the long weekend when Yoko fixed him up with May Pang, her secretary, and ba basically chucked him out from about 1972 till 1974. John's next two albums, Mind Games from 1973 and Walls and Bridges from 1974, were essentially about winning Yoko back. So on Double Fantasy, He's still lamenting those years, really. Um, but you might need to shed several tears when John sings Beautiful Boy to his toddler son, Sean. I know I do. If you can bear it, Milk and Honey from 1984 is John and Yoko's uh, output. John was killed in December 1980, so his contributions are posthumous, some originating from cassette tape demos. I haven't heard this record since 1984. When I was so sad, I couldn't bear to hear it again. Just purely down to John's passing. It's been years since I've played that album. But again, you'll find it uh, on Apple Music, Spotify, whatever. Um, I'm going to leave my script just for a second or two. And just say that if there's an album that you do not want to start with for Yoko do not listen to Fly. Fly is another one that was made with the Plastic Ono Band and Elephant's Memory and stuff like that. And again, there are some tracks that go on for three quarters of a century. And yes, there is a lot of caterwauling. There are some good rhythms. There are some, there's some you know, really good instrumental arrangements and stuff on there. Far better than the rubbish that was on album two of Sometime in New York City. But by and large, it's one to stay away from. Uh, it's just too much, especially nowadays with all the bonus tracks and this was when we farted in 1971 and stuff like that, that that's all on there. And it's just a little bit too much, I think for most people. In fact, I couldn't get, all the way through to the end of the deluxe version at all. Just couldn't, it was too much, too much. 
So despite all the reservations I've alluded to above, I do hope many of you will find a place for Yoko. Even if your hitherto experience has only been caterwauling and screaming. Play Yes I'm a Witch a few times, you will be hooked. Yoko was simply a victim of the times that she found herself in. By the time you hear Take Me to the Land of Hell, you'll have learnt to love Yoko and her music. All I'm saying is give Yoko a chance. Leave Yoko alone! I love you. Ta-ra!